And it's about the power of God's Word and how we too can experience the power of God's Word. And so hence you talked about, we've talked about, we've seen different activities about different giftings and so on. And I want to tell you that the, even as I was preparing my heart about this, how we, and there'll be different topics. There's no such thing as, because uh, the Word of God is so, so large. There's so many things, uh, even in one book, to do a word study or to do a, a study of a, of a scripture uh, theme through a book it would take months and months. So we're going to allow the different people who are speaking to share their own, their own uh, experience in the power of God's Word because God's Word is powerful. Now, you've probably heard this an old one, but it's a good one. This uh, woman who was being taught by the Bible college professor to say, you need to learn scripture. You need to know the scripture because when you never know when you're going to need to use this scripture. And so, so she learned, she learned uh, scripture very clearly and very profoundly. And, and so one day she was coming home uh, reasonably late at night from the Bible college uh, that she was attending. And uh, they'd just been teaching in the book of acts and so uh, anyway so when she got into the house she found the house open and and there was a man about to walk out the back door with a big television set and so uh, so uh, so she yelled out acts 238 and the man froze hold held the tv and and uh, while he was standing there she rang the police and took a few minutes for the police to come and he was still standing there and and then the police came and arrested the guy and they said, we can't understand for the life of me, why didn't you just keep running? And she said, well, she had an accent, 238. <laughs> how, how would I possibly run? And so, I know it's an old one, but if you read Acts 238, it's a pretty good verse to, to know. And, uh, and so it's, it's powerful. I don't want to talk about the, uh, the incredible power of and the power of the, of the word. But let me tell you that in the gospel of John, John chapter one, it begins. Within the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. And when he talks about the word, how uh, that through him all things were made, nothing was made, without him nothing was made that has been made. And he goes on to say that, the, that uh, the incredible power of God's word is so powerful that you and I can understand. It says the word became flesh. And, and when that becomes flesh, the God of the universe started with the word. He said the word. In the beginning was the Word. And so I want to talk to you this morning about what's the most, who's the most important person in, in, uh, in the world? You see, in today's language, you know, you probably, uh, if you're a servant, well, you're probably somebody on the lower rung on the ladder, but if you're the person who's reclining at the table, or who's the head of the table, well, he's the one who's the greater. Well, the, the disciples were having this discussion one time. They're having this communication with, with each other. And there arose a, a dispute in Luke 22. It says there arose a, a dispute among them as to which one was regarded to be the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. But let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest and as the leader, as a servant. And then, of course, Jesus said, who's the greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? And Jesus said, but I am among you as the one who serves. It's interesting how Jesus told them the greatest must be a servant. And then he confessed his own position as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, as the one who serves. Understanding the serving gift is a gift important because serving has defined as a, in our culture as a lowly, unwanted role. But Jesus showed us that serving is everything we get to devote our lives to. Once we obtain the definition of serving, we'll begin to see it as God sees it the greatest role to aspire to in our lives. 
So what's the definition of serving? It simply is this, to give life. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to, but to serve. And then he says this, and to give my life as a ransom for many. So Jesus poured out his whole life into serving because he understands the power of it. He said, to give my life as a ransom for many. You see, the goal of serving is not just to the task of serving, the goal of serving, but, is, but by people seeing our good works. When people see our good works, then they give glory to God who's in heaven. Because the Bible says, let your, men, let your light so shine before men so that they will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, the driving motivation of our serving is not for our own glorification. The driving force of our motivation is, to, is so that we can point people to God. And of course, Judy and I have been trying and modeling that. Remember, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, we're not talking about making clones. We're talking about a lifestyle. And of course, you know, oftentimes we ministers say, as goes the pulpit, so goes the pews. So obviously, you know, we need to say, do things, not just say things. Words are very cheap, someone said. But I remember I was a young pastor, uh, newly ordained, and I was asked, I was, I, I'd already been a Christian, I was an elder in the church, and, and I had been to Hillsong conferences in the past, and, but I was asked to go and serve Pastor Trevor Chandler at this Hillsong conference that he was going to, and they asked me would I be just there for him and, and do what I can to make his, uh, his uh, role uh, easy, you know, basically a fetch and carry, I guess I was, I go for it and go for this and go for that. But the fact is, I was there. And, and, uh, and he said, that the, he said you, think about this, Eugene. If you want to come, uh, you can come with me. We'll fly down together. You'll have to sit where I am. And uh, obviously, you'll have to, you know, be in every meeting that I go to. And, uh, and even after, you have to go to the suppers at Brian Houston's house with the team and all the guest speakers. And I said, oh, I think I'll, I'll pray about that. No, I said, yes, of course, I'll be there. You know, I mean, I, was, I knew the speakers and I looked up to these speakers. And so I was, I was get ready to go and I was so excited. I couldn't sleep the night before we flew down to Sydney. We get to Sydney, we get picked up by some other server and we get driven to the, the hotel and then we get driven to the, to, the, to the conference, walk straight by the long queues into the very place. Where we were. I thought I was in heaven. And, uh, but I was there to serve Pastor Trevor. And so... And of course, had my photo taken with all the big shots uh, in supper time and so on. And had the, I mean, I thought the supper was, I mean, the conference was fantastic. The supper was to die for. But I tell you, I thought this was absolutely superb. And then on the way home, flying back home, I was so dejected. I thought, my goodness, I've got to go back to my office planning the pastoral work and the youth pastoring, and, which was my ministry of serving. And God spoke to my heart. He said, the same zeal, the same passion that you served Pastor Trevor with at the Hillsong Conference is the same passion and same zeal you should do your own ministry and serving, whatever the service is. And I was floored. I mean, I've got to tell you, I had one of those wake-up calls and uh, God slapped me around a little bit and, uh, and he said, and I realised that that was the reason why the Lord sent me down on that weekend or that week to serve him. And as a result, it changed my ministry, it changed my life. And I've got to tell you that sometimes we, we don't understand the role of serving, whatever it may be. It may be Steve who takes the team down to the gate and welcomes people. Or it may be Harold at the sound desk, or it may be someone looking after the children. It doesn't matter where you serve. The fact is we do serve the audience of one. And, uh, and sometimes we sort of get so 
caught up. We used to say in the early years that, you know, here you are, and maybe you and I are similar. I used to say, Lord, here I am, use me. And then when somebody does use it, God, I've been used. (laughs) And, you know, it's like, yes, that's why you're here. You're here so that you can serve me. And it's like, the, 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 you know, we're coming into this th- third last month of this year where we're talking about growing, growing in our ministry, growing in our serving, growing in our love for God, growing in our impact into our community. I've got to tell you that sometimes, you know, we, we sort of aspire to something, but I want to give you three quick points about, or three stages, if you like, about serving. And the first one is start where you are. Start where you are. Start right at your workplace. See your job as your ministry. See the very work that you're doing, your secular job as your ministry. Have you ever seen people whom you could tell that they see their job as something God has asked them to do and they have this smile on their face, they've got this passion, they've got this joy and they, man, there's no stopping them because they feel whatever they're doing, they're doing for the audience of one. They're not serving men, but they're serving God. They don't, I mean, you're in a job situation where you're toiling from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and you get paid for that but you don't do it for the pay, you're doing it for God. Because whatever we do, that's what we do for God. Remember King David, this year, he saw himself as the governmental job, as his calling and his ministry. Joseph, when he was working in Egypt, he was the Department of Health in Egypt and he saw his job as his ministry. And of course, because he did, God used him to deliver Israel from a severe famine. The fact is that we need to see ourselves in whatever area we're in. God is calling us to do the same thing for we are working for the Lord and not for people. Scripture says in Colossians 3.23, I love this. He says, work hard and cheerfully at whatever you do as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Then all of a sudden, it's not going, oh, I've been used. No, whatever you do, Scripture says, do to the best of your ability because you're working for Him. By starting where we are, each act of service to the Lord becomes great because God bless it and, he resp- and, he, and we respond to our call. Christians should be the best workers in the Redlands, I believe. Christians should be the best people. I, I used to... I used to, when I first joined the Air Force, I was in the Air Force for a number of years and I became a Christian while I was in the Air Force. And of course, I had this work ethic before I became a minister, but I didn't want to tell anyone about the fact that I was a Christian because Christians had a terrible name in the Air Force uh, in the area that I was working in with avionics and airplanes and because they weren't doing the best They should. Near enough was good enough. They did just enough to get by. And so I didn't want to tell anyone that I was a Christian. I just, I had, but because I had a good name and I didn't want to associate with those who didn't have a good name. And so for a long time I did that. In fact, there was one time, you know, there was a guy who came into the church and he had this big, big, into my, my area and he had this big sticker in the car. Christians are not perfect, but they're forgiven. And everybody says, there's a Christian coming into our, our, our section. There's a Christian coming in our section. And watch out for him. And of course then, but this guy, and he was the first Pentecostal Christian that I had met since I was born again. And his work ethic was superb. He was living this. He was living as though he was working for the audience of one. He was living for, as though he was serving God, whatever he was doing. And so we became friends. And one time, uh, this guy was a Christian a lot longer than I was. I was just a brand new Christian at that point. But he, we were doing something and one of the guys burnt himself repairing some minuscule sort of a, an equipment and, and he burnt himself and yelled at Jesus Christ. And the guy says, what, is he coming? You know, and uh, I thought that was, a, you've got to have a sense of humour as well. But I've got to tell you that even in the military, you can 
shine. Whatever work you're doing, you start doing what God's called you to do. I was still had a number of years left, or I don't know, maybe 10, 10 years left to go before I retired from the Air Force. So I was, I was doing this scripture because I said, I'm still serving God in whatever I do. So start where you are. Develop and express the heart of a servant through whatever you do. And I enjoy watching, um, she's not here today, uh, Gretel or um, Des, Desiree coming into the office. Man, the work for the doll people love them. They just, I mean, they love Desiree's uh, scones and they love Gretel's cookies. Say, Desiree. Okay, Desi, I call her anyway. She, she, they, they, they just love both those ladies. They come in and, and they're smiling and they're jo- enjoying what they're doing because you see, they're working for the Lord. And I want to encourage you to whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. My question is, how do you see your job? Do you see it as a necessary, necessary burden or do you, that we call ministry? How can you begin to Make it so that you're doing it for the Lord and it changes your whole perspective. You see, the first stage of developing a heart of a servant is start right where you are and you'll begin to see the gift flourish. If you're wondering how to sustain a willing servant's heart, here is the second stage that will keep your heart in the right place. And the second stage is do hidden service. Service that nobody knows about. Service that only you and God know about. Matthew 6 says in verse 3, but when you give to someone, don't tell your left hand what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in secret and your Father who knows all secrets will reward you. You see, hidden service is simply beginning to give a share in such a way that the person receiving cannot possibly give it back to you. He cannot possibly even know. He doesn't even need to know who it is that's giving it. Hidden service is one of the best things to sustain a heart of a servant and keep a clean and, and a clean heart and a clean mind about serving. You see, hidden service uh, stage is a, is of, a, of a servant is one, best dis- is one of the best disciplines for our hearts because it keeps our hearts and intentions pure. And we need to check that. That's when, when God spoke to me about, what are you doing? Do you want to do, are you doing this to be noticed or are you doing it because you love me? And so, ever heard the saying, it's not how you play the game, but how you look when you play the game? Well, the fact is, we need to make sure that we play the game fair. We need to make sure that whatever we do in it, whatever service we do, we do it for God because God tells us that uh, we need to practice this hidden service to keep our heart healthy and whole. And so I believe this is a very important aspect of serving. The third stage is extended serving with a joyful and glad heart. Nothing is worse than seeing somebody who's not enjoying what they're doing. And, and I think that if we enjoy whatever we do, whether it's hiding behind the sound desk or doing in the back room. Um, yes, no, can't hide there, Josh. I can see you. But you see, you, you, you can tell somebody who's enjoying what they're doing. It's not just because there's a sparkle, sparkle in their eyes, but sometimes we're doing it because we like doing what we're doing as opposed to doing it because God is pleased. I love the song, Well Done. Well done. I want to hear that when, I, when I'm done. Well done, good and faithful servant. And so whatever it is, friends, we're coming into this season of the carols here in the school. We're coming into different aspects of the church. We are going to need to raise up our, our serving in different ways. In our church, we've already got a lot of people serving. There are a lot of people doing different things. And... Um, I forgot to mention you, Barbara, because when you come into the office, people also love the way you just, just do your stuff. And, and it's amazing what people do, you know, how they reckon, because they can tell. Even those people who come into our, who are unsafe people, they can tell when somebody is really enjoying the work that, that they see being done. 
And so when we're doing the extended service, and that is when you go beyond your capacity, beyond your comfort zone. And I know we we all like our comfort zone. Liz was talking about the comfort zone earlier. But the fact is we do like our comfort zone. But when God says, I want you to extend yourself. You see, growth comes when you extend yourself. Growth doesn't come. If you're doing weights, you don't just do weights that you can do so easily and you could do about 15, 20 reps. When, you, when, you, when you've got to go there and have someone's behind you to, to make sure that you're going to get this thing up there. And, and the fact is that when you grow, when you extend yourself in every situation, whether, I mean, I, I do a circuit of walk where I walk and I, I know that in 10 minutes I should be at this point. And if I'm either... 10, min- 10 meters either side, I know I need to sort of either step up my game or whatever. And so I, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I know a difference e- each 10 minute segment where I should be. And so it keeps me a check it, because I try to extend myself. I don't want to become an Olympian at my age, but I want to stay fit. And so I want to extend myself in, in my physical training, in my growth, in my, in my learning scripture. And... Um, and uh, I, I got to tell you that we need to understand how we can grow with the Word of God. The Word of God, and I started saying this at the beginning, that in the beginning was the Word. And so I thought I'll, I'll go and uh, do this whole um, uh, memorizing of Scripture. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine who, who said that, uh, who said that uh, in the early days of missionaries, they had to learn a whole book, not a chapter, but a whole book. This person had to memorize the book of Romans, 16 chapters, the book of Ephesians, six chapters before they could take communion. And I thought to myself, my, what would our generation say about that? Let the cup go by it kind of deal. My goodness. And I thought, how would you think about stretching ourselves? I don't know when our, our children's church in, the, in early days of Ipswich, back in the early 80s, we, we, had, we, we taught people script, memorizing scripture and verses and stuff. And so we need to be able to memorize verses. And I thought, well, I'll try myself memorizing the first 14 verses of the gospel of John chapter one, because it says in the beginning, the be- in the, it says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness hasn't understood it. And it... Uh, I need help. Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure where I am now. But anyway, I'll, I'll finish there. But I, I, I memorized this verse and, and I've been saying it the last two days. And, and so when I don't have an audience. But I got to tell you, I stretched myself in learning. I decided that I'm going to learn certain verses. So that, not so that I can say, tick me off God, I've learned five scriptures, or I've learned one chapter. But the fact is we need to... S- Grow in the Word of God. Because when you grow in the Word of God, it has tremendous power for you and I. So that's the stage three. So that uh, while, while, you can, while you can recognize that God's Word is powerful and God's Word is necessary, we can, we can believe God that as we not just read the Scripture, but apply the Scripture, it really helps you and I. So um, I also said this, serving translates to favour. Favour translates to influence and influence leads to authority. And I think that serving is not the lowest rung. Serving is actually a very high gift. It's, a, it's not a... It's not a natural, it can, it can be a natural gift to some people, but it's a gift that it's God-given and you can, you can fashion it yourself so that you can understand what is God saying to you. 
Deuteronomy 28, verse 47 and 48 says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies. And I thought that's a challenging thought for each and every one of us because Jesus being moved with compassion, fed the multitudes, laid hands on the child, laid hands on the leper. They were healed because Jesus was moved. And when we get moved by the things that move God, our life gets transformed. So my prayer for this month of October, that whatever you learn from the Word of God, and we're going to have testimonies. We didn't have time today, but we're going to have testimonies of certain growth stages. People have done some tremendous, have had some incredible growth. I've talked to different people and they've said to me, oh, I've grown so much this year. It's been this and this and this. So I'd like to hear testimonies so that, and I'd like you to hear them so that you can be encouraged about the fact that this is a year of growth for each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand, shall we?